I tend to get a little nervous. But it's not because of, um, I have any doubt that what I'm looking at is the truth. I question myself at times, but um, I know this. Um, God has given me something. And I believe it will be a benefit. If you can put up the PowerPoint, I usually will pray, but if it's such a good prayer, I'm thinking we're already there. There is a scripture, if you've got your Bibles, if you want to turn with me in the second chronicles, of chapter 36. And it's verse 15. I enjoyed the message this morning. I thought this when Brother Stroman started, he, uh, he said, I'm going to give you the title and tell you what I'm going to preach on, and then I'll just fill in the, fill in the rest. And, and then I thought about uh, Brother Oliveira Sunday. He said, I was sitting there, and I kept thinking, where is he going? Where is he going? And that's kind of what we want to do is... Um, I want to look at a couple pictures, and um, not really tell you where I'm going yet, but hopefully that you'll kind of stop and ponder and think about what we're saying. See, sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it like a book, but it's more than a book. It's, it's more like a, a puzzle that there are pieces that you have to reach out and grab here and there, and, and when you bring them together, then all of a sudden it creates a beautiful picture. But you've got to bring it all together to see that picture. Uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verse 15, and it said, The Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up in times and sending, because he had compassion on his people, and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people so there was no remedy. When it says they despised his words, it, it really means they counted his words as, as worthless. There was no value to them. And, and I like this scripture because um, it, it, it can it compels us to ask the question, what was it really like at that point in time? Because God would not just send a prophet, it said he would send messengers. And the messengers would all have a message of a, of a coming judgment, but the purpose of the message of a coming judgment was really God's compassion. His desire that they would hear the message and that they would turn around. Right. You know, he, he gave us an example in Nineveh. Yeah. Where there was a message of a coming judgment, but because of the, the, the hearts of the people being turned, it kept the judgment from coming. Amen? Yeah. If we can go to the second slide. There is a... Um, timeline I'm going to set before you tonight. I'm not setting dates, but it is a timeline. Um, the exact dates according to which history you read may be off a couple of years. But the, the season of time is correct. And what is taking place in that period of time. What we're going to look at is the season of time between when the ten northern tribes were taken into Assyrian captivity, and then when the two southern tribes were taken into Babylon. It was a period of approximately 120 years. Kind of like Brother Stroman mentioned about the flood in, in 120 years. And when you look at this, when if you were in Judah, when Israel was taken into captivity, it should, should have woke you up. It should have made you think, Lord, if these, thy people, your chosen people, are taken into uh, captivity, uh, what about us? We've highlighted Jeremiah because 
We know about Jeremiah and his prophecy that they would be 70 years in captivity. But we have these other prophets up here also because they too have something to say in this season of time. And when you listen to all the prophets, as the Lord will talk about by two or three witnesses, he was confirming to the people, not just through a man, but through many men, that there is a judgment that is coming upon the children of Israel. If we go back in time to 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 28, it says this, Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. It's a wonderful message. Uh, I was listening to Brother Stroman talk about it. He, he destroyed Baal and, and he destroyed Jezebel in her religion. But when you read the scripture, what you read, and, and maybe I'll, I'll just mention some so I won't have to take too long. He, he did what God asked him to do, but he came short of it. He never destroyed the golden calf. So what God did is he looked at Jehu and he said, basically, I should judge your house for the sins of Jeroboam, just like I did the other kings. And what he would do is he usually in the second generation, he would destroy that kingdom and bring in someone else. But he said, because you did all these other things that I asked you to do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four generations after you. But, in the fourth generation, I will judge your house. Amen? See, there's a promise if we could only do what's right. Like David, he said, I will give you a sure house. That's what he promised Jeroboam, too. If you only do what's right, I will establish your household and your kingdom. But they never did that. In Hosea chapter 1, in verse 1, the word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Beery in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel. It's interesting, in the third generation, Josiah's great-great-grandson or whatever it would be, they named him Jeroboam. And I'm thinking, Jeroboam's not a good name. That's the one that the prophets had come time and time again and said, this is the problem in Israel, is that it's the sins of Jeroboam. It's the golden calf. In verse 4, and the Lord God, and the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jacob. So what this is, it is in the scripture, he's saying God is going to fulfill what he said, because now we're in the third generation. In the next generation, I am going to judge Jeroboam's, I mean Jacob's household. And then he says, and will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. So not only am I going to judge his house, I will also judge Israel. It takes us about a 40 year period of time. The last one of jo Josiah, I mean, Jacob's household dies. He brings in another, he gives him a generation, 40 years, and then Israel is taken into captivity from approximately 723 B.C. But then we see when we're coming close to the Babylonian captivity, uh, within, a, within a really the last generation, the, the 40 years before that, uh, something starts to take place. In the book of Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 2, he says this, I will utterly consume all things from off the land, saith the Lord. And then in verse 18, he says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. Hey, a lot of people, that's what they trust in. Their silver and their gold and their wealth. And he said, none of these things are going to help you when I bring my wrath against you. 
But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all of them that dwell in the land. This is approximately 630 BC. The following year, 629, a man named Jeremiah rises up. And you know what it's going to be? It's going to be the same message. It's going to be much more detailed, but it's the same message. In Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Hey, think about that. He never told him to go down to the, the, the bars or the restaurants or something like this. I want you to go to the Lord's house and what you're going to do is speak to people that are coming to worship the Lord. But is it acceptable worship? We'll get more into that later. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, a man, your ways and your doings. You know what that means? Repent. All right. And that's to the church. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. A man, your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Well, the prophet said, but, the, but God's telling them, if you can repent, you can avert the judgment that is coming. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. You know what they're saying? God will never judge us. We've got the temple. We're God's chosen people. Amen? We're saved. See, the, the ten tribes, they didn't have the temple. And God took them away. But us, we are to be elect. We are the chosen. We have the temple. And God would never do that. For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense in the veil, and walk after other gods whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say we are delivered to do all these abominations? In other words, can you live like the world, and come into this place, and expect God's blessings upon your life? Amen? That's what he's asking them. You were called to be a light of the world, but you walk in darkness. Can I allow this to continue? Is this house, which is called by my name, become a dead of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go ye now to my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. You know why he's taking back in time? Go back to Shiloh. I set my name there. But they walked in darkness. And I judged that place. And I brought it to another. But now because you have done all these works, said the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and into this place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I've done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. What he's saying, even as I carried Israel into captivity, I will do the same to you. Amen. In Jeremiah 32 and verse 28, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of their Chaldeans, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. 
in verse 33, and they have turned unto me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. See, it's not because God didn't warn them or did You know what? When you read the book of Jeremiah, it's as if a man is pleading with his wife. He says, what more could I have done for you? But she just turns and walks away. See, this is what he said until there was no remedy. In other words, he, he, did, sorry, he did everything he could to try to turn them around, but finally, all I could do is bring judgment on these people. A couple of years later, 626, the prophet Habakkuk rises up. In Habakkuk 1, verse 6, it says, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that Babylon, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land, possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. About that same period of time, God would raise up a woman, hey, a prophetess, and she would have a word for him. You know what she would say? 2 Kings chapter 22, in verse 13, the question is, go to me and inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened to the words of this book, to do according to all that which is written concerning us. So they went unto Huldah, the prophetess. Verse 15, and this is what she said. And she said unto them, Thus said the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, Thus said the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place, and shall not be quenched. She told the king, it's not going to happen in your day, but it's going to happen. All the things that these other prophets are speaking, I would lift, lift up my voice in unity with them and say this, Israel, you sin. You've turned your back on God. You worship idols. I called you to be a light to the world and you walk in darkness. Brother Strong, if the salt has lost its savor, what good is it but to be thrown away? When Israel ceases to be a light, what value? Because really they lead people astray. See, there's a tremendous truth to that. If we walk in darkness, we make people think that is acceptable. Brother Keith was telling me about his grandfather. And he said he told the, the church one time, if, if you're going to walk like the world, I can't stop you, but I will ask you one question. I uh, have one request. I hope I get this right. He says, when you're out in public, don't tell anybody that you come to church here. <laughs> because I don't want them to think this is what we believe. Yes. Amen? Yes. Because when you go out in society, you are all called to be alive. Yes. Not only will you reflect Jesus Christ, yes. but you are a reflection of the congregation where you attend. Yes. And a witness to what that place could be. And what value when your testimony is in, in conflict to the Word of God. Yes. 
The next one, we have Nahum up there, a little star beside it, because um, he actually spoke in about 713, so you can bring him back to about the time of Assyria. But this is what he says, Nahum chapter 1 and verse 1, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. Nahum's prophecy is the destruction of Nineveh. See, y'all know the story about Jonah. Jonah went and he, and he warned Nineveh and Nineveh turned around. They repented. They, they sought God and God was merciful. And you know who they were? It's the Syrians. It's the enemy. But God is merciful. Amen? Amen. Not only to uh, his chosen people, but to a people that can look to him and believe in faith and repent. And they repent and, and, and God spared them. But you know what Naaman's all about? Nineveh has gone back to a wicked place. Right. And now, there is no turning. You know what? It, it shows us a principle. God is long-suffering. Amen? Yeah. That's a good thing to know. God is long-suffering. Yeah. But he will not suffer forever. There comes a day, an hour, when he realizes his mercy extended to you, that you are trampling at other feet. Right. They have a message today in the church world. <coughs> Excuse me. They call it grace. But it's lawlessness. It's anarchy. You want anarchy? Nobody's in the government. Everybody goes their own way. And Nineveh had turned their backs on God. They had went back to the very things that was bringing judgment upon them in the first place. And Nahum declares judgment. That's about 613. And the history I was looking at, like I said, You'll need to read different histories and it'll be a little bit different, but it says about 608, the Babylonian captivity begins. So you know, it's really the mercy of God. If you're living in Israel, Judah, and here's this prophecy that's been laying there for a hundred years, and now, Brother Keith, you know what it would make me think? Oh my. These prophets are seeking the truth. If it happened to Nineveh, it could have happened to us. But Nineveh are dogs. And we are the bride of Christ, or maybe not, I should say. We are the chosen people. But you know what the problem is? The chosen people live like dogs. They live like the Gentiles. Yet they think they're safe and secure. In around 600 days, God would bring them a condenser over a course of two or three sieges and judge Judah. And even if Jeremiah would say, you will go into captivity for 70 years, you will compromise up to over two years. And Jeremiah said, no, that's not what God said. It'd be 70. But even in that, God says, 
even in your captivity, I'm doing this to somehow awaken your heart. He said, he said, I said, prophet after prophet after prophet, it does no good. So maybe I can bring judgment. Because in the Bible it says in judgment men learn righteousness. They understand. So even in the judgment of God, we can see the mercy of God. Okay. Take a good pic, take a good look, make it, maybe take a picture, because we're going to go to another another subject. We're going to go past the, the judgment of God. And what we're going to talk about is revival. Um, hey, that's a better message, huh? More like love If you go to the next slide. Uh, a different timeline. It is the, um, the period of time of King Josiah. And Josiah was uh, quite an amazing man. He sought God with all his heart. He loved the Lord. If we go back, all the way back to the division of the kingdom between uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, when God split this thing. And to Jeroboam was a promise. If you will only do what is right, I will establish your kingdom over Israel, even like I established the kingdom of Judah under David. But Jeroboam, he couldn't believe God. He started thinking and he said, you know, if, if the people go to Jerusalem to worship, I'll lose them. So what I got to do is I got to do something to say, keep them. But the reality of it was, I'm sure he didn't have to do nothing to keep them. If he would have only done what was right, God would have kept them. I think this is interesting. He built a golden calf in Bethel and one in Dan. And what's interesting, if you look on the map, that was very close to Jerusalem. Dan is about as far away as you can get. That's kind of how the devil is. He will try to, if you want to get close to God, he'll be there to stop you. And if you want to walk in the world, he'll be there for you too. So he builds these idols. And you know what he, he, he creates holidays? Hey, personally, that's why I don't think much of Christmas. It's a, it's a holiday created. But he said, in these holidays, we're worshiping God. In the golden calf, we're worshiping God. And you know what? He makes a priesthood. He does a lot of things to make it look like this is God. It wasn't God. And 1 Kings 13 and 1, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord out of Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born into the house of David, Josiah by name. It will be approximately 325 years until Josiah is born. The prophecy is about 975. Josiah is the part in the blue, born about 650. Oh my, that's God. There's going to be a man come, and Josiah 
And upon these shall we offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and man's bones shall be burned upon thee. That's what's going to take place. They're going to burn bones on this altar of man. If we come forward and behind to approximately 650, Josiah is born. And I don't think they were trying to match it up. Oh, let's name him Josiah so he will, hey, a God. He named that child. I don't know what condition his mom was in, his dad was in, but God was able to, you know, I, I think this, the Lord told me one time, he said, you were not named Timothy by chance. You know what, my mom was a young Catholic woman. Yet God named me. Anybody believe that? He could do those things. And this young man and this young woman has this little baby, and they said, what are we going to name him? He said, let's name him Josiah. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one in 30 years. So 642, he's eight years old, and he's established as the king of Judah. Um, he will live till approximately 611. He will live 39 years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand or to the left. And then it says this in verse 3, For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. So you do the math. Young people, listen to this. 16 years old. That's all he was. 16 years old, just, just a youth. But something started stirring in his heart, and he started seeking after God. Amen. Hey, young people, you don't have to wait. When God starts to stir something in your heart, believe there is a reason behind that. So Josiah, just this young man, Something starts to stir in his heart and, and he starts to seek after seek after God. Verse 3. And in the twelfth year, twenty years old, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. See, what we see throughout the history of Judah, when you will read about the different kings, they'll say he had a heart like David, or he did not have a heart like David. But over and over you'll see this, yet they did not remove the high places. You know what it is? It, it, the high places had a sentimental value to them. God says, when I, build, when I place my name on the temple, you don't need to worship in high places anymore. But you know what? It's, that's what mom and dad did. And it, it brings a warm feeling. And we like to keep our traditions. And, but he's constantly reminding them. Josiah says what we need to do is get rid of the high places. Amen? And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them. He cut down in the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strove it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. Then he burned the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. That's what that prophet had said.
said to take place. And now it is possible. Amen. But then, at 26 years old, about the 624 mark, something happens. They find the Word of God. You know, I, I would ask this question, how do you lose the Word of God? You know, you, you got the temple, and you've lost the Word of God. And I'm afraid the same thing is happening in the churches today. They've lost the Word of God. Second Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 9. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he read his clothes. You know why? <laughs> he read, you know, he, he, he's happy, he's, he's making reforms, they're, they're changing things, they're, he's tearing down altars and idols and all these things, and, and then he, he finds the word of God and, and they read it and he says, oh no. <laughs> we are we are in trouble. Verse 21, he says this, Go and inquire the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do all after all that is written in this book. Oh my, he's, he's concerned. If... What I read is true, and I, I believe it is the Word of God, then judgment's coming. And what are we going to do? Verse 31, And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments. Lord, my fathers have fed kings of Israel and family, but Lord, I, I make a covenant with you, Lord, that I'm going to serve you with all my heart. Amen? To walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. And Josiah, verse 33, took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertain to the children of Israel. You know what Josiah did? You know, he's the king of Judah, but he goes into Israel and he destroys the golden calves. Time. Get rid of these things. Amen? I read this, I thought it was good. It says this, one of the greatest recorded revivals took place in the southern kingdom of Judah during the reign of Josiah. As a teenager, something happened that caused him to begin to seek after the Lord. The 16-year-old king began to develop a hunger to know God. Josiah acted upon his seeking heart when he began a process of repentance and turning from sin that impacted him personally as well as the nation of Judah. Josiah led the nation in purging the land of its idols. As the temple was being repaired, the workmen discovered, discovered the lost scrolls of the law. Judah had fallen away so completely from God that they had literally lost God's word. Amen. If you go to the next slide. In this process of revival, in the hour of Josiah, I wrote down these five words that are um, really the expression of the revival in Josiah's heart. Uh, number one, it begins with a hunger, uh, 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 a longing to experience God. 
more than just what I've heard, I want to experience him. Amen? Hey, if we're going to receive something from God, we need to hunger after God. Because the scripture tells us that he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness, they shall be filled. But I will tell you this, if you have no hunger, And the second point, repentance. It begins with a turning away from the things of this world and a turning to God. It is the, the, the turning of the hearts back to God. It's more than being sorry. Because the Bible said that godly sorrow leads to repentance. So the conviction of sin and the sorrow that comes is only the beginning of what God wants us to do is that it causes us to turn from the way we're walking and to walk in a different direction. Amen. And then once we do that, what he desires to do is, is to bring about a cleansing. To cleanse our lives from all the idols. And you know what it is, the things that exalt themselves against God. He wants, to, he wants to begin a process. It doesn't happen in a moment. He begins a process that we've got to clean out everything. And you know, even when he, Brother Keith, even when he cleaned out all these things, he came and found something in the Word of God that told him, you're not done yet. There's more. You've got to get rid of these things. So he continues this process of cleansing the idols and, and the things of his life. And the fourth one is a, a humility. It is to yield himself to God. Hey, that's what humility is all about. It should be simple. God is great. We sing these songs. How great is our God? We worship, we magnify Him. Yet, we make ourselves the Lord of our lives. How foolish is that? There is a God in heaven that is powerful and majestic and mighty and he wants to be your Lord. Yet, you want to oh, You know, Jesus asked him, why don't you call me Lord and don't do what I ask you to do? So in Josiah, there is this, this humbling of yourself. He is a great king. But he knows this, there is a king that is greater than I. And he humbles himself. And the fifth one is, now we shall walk in obedience. Amen? And how can we walk in obedience unless we know his voice? Unless we know his will, his purpose. We must know these things. Amen? So, amen? Are you still happy? Yeah. I don't know when I started. Um, we, the Lord's here, and I believe you're attentive to what he's saying. So, I, I, I presented a picture to you about a judgment of God, and I presented a picture to you of a revival. And then I will ask you the question, do you know how the two tie together? And what is the purpose of this message? If you go to uh, the next slide, it is the exact same 
period of time. Interesting, do When all these prophets are rising up and warning of a judgment to come, at the same time, there is a revival in Israel. Amen? You know what the problem is? To many, the revival was only on the surface. But it didn't change their hearts. Big changes in Israel! But not in the hearts. You know, that's what Paul had told, that prophecy of Paul, it was to just Josiah. She said, because you were tender in your heart, because you sucked out of all your heart, I will not bring judgment in your day. But it's coming. About three years after Josiah dies, Babylon comes in. Second Kings chapter 23 and verse 25 says this, And like unto him, Josiah, was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, and with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses? Neither after him arose there any like him. Notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, whereas his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him with all. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen, in the house of which I said, My name shall be there. I read this, I thought it was good, I'll share it with you. One of the keys to understanding the book of Jeremiah is to see that the reforms of Josiah failed to permeate the general population. This was not from a lack of effort or zeal on Josiah's part. No king prior to Josiah did as much to rid the land of his places of idol worship. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. However, right from the beginning, the word of the Lord through the prophets indicated that the reforms would have little redeeming effect. Consider that Jeremiah began speaking the word of the Lord before Josiah's reforms began. Then consider that these reforms continued for 13 years, yet not one word of those reforms occupied the pages of Jeremiah. Oh my. That's why some people don't put the pieces together. Jeremiah never talks about, oh no, we're having a revival. But they were. Some were. Because Jeremiah looks deeper. And he saw a people that their hearts were far from God. See, it's, it's a wonderful thing, Brother Strongman, if you are on fire for God. And Brother out there, if you have a passion for God. But if the people are only going through the motions, then what lies before us? See, Josiah was so on fire for God. And he, he Brother Keith, he's, he's leading the nation. He's encouraging the nation. We got to turn back to God. And the people had a form of godliness. But their hearts, Brother Strowman, like you said this morning, they carried their idols in their back pocket. 
were never able to distance themselves from the things that God found detestable. I think this this morning. That was an important message. But, but I think this, some, I have no desire for those, those things. But I'm afraid the reason that a message is given is because some want to walk with Christ and want to walk in spiritual dimensions that are forbidden. It says this, the people of Judah were deeply committed to their gods. To be sure, they worshiped the Lord, but not him alone. See, God said, I am a jealous God. You can't worship me in another. But that was the promise of Israel. That's why he can tell Jeremiah, go to the temple. Because you know what? The people are still going to church. Just their hearts is divided. You know what? Anybody want a wife that has a boyfriend? I don't think God does either. And that's what was going on. He said, you had to play the heart of it. See, they, they didn't quit going to the temple, but they their eyes also. So, in the heart of a, a few, not just Josiah, a few, there is revival. But in the heart of many, there is apostasy. And Josiah dies. And listen to 2 Chronicles 35 and verse 25. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. But from he must have thought, my, he's gone. That was a good man. Okay. It shows you that the tie-in together. Amen. If we go to the next slide. Where are we at? Amen. Amen. This is what Brother Branham said in 1960. Well, let me reference this. We won't read the scriptures to kind of try to bring this to a close. But the Bible tells us that the Lord will not return until there is a great falling away. Amen? So when, if we're looking for Jesus to come back, then we can only expect to see the world will lie in gross darkness. Not only will the world lie in darkness, the scripture tells us that in this last church age, that the church will have grown lukewarm. That it's um, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Brother Branham said this in 1960. And he's talking about the United States, but it's, it's relevant, I believe. She's on her downward move right now. She'll never come back again. She's gone, 
That's right. She's been God since 1956 when she condemned and turned away God from the great revival hours. In the 50s, God moved in a marvelous way in the United States. He really set before the United States a choice. And um, she rejected him. God. Oh, they, they continued to go to church. They actually started building mega churches. But in the spirit realm, the prophet would say, something's happening. Amen? Listen to what he says in 1958. It's a disgrace. She's gone. The whole nation's polluted. It's rotten to the core. Anybody, you know, in some message churches, they can quote this. Anybody know what he says after that? Let me read this again. It's a disgrace. She's gone. The whole nation's polluted. It's rotten to the core because the church let down. It ought to be the standard. Oh, my. People blame politics and the world and things like this. But here's the prophet of God and he's looking beyond the what you can see on the surface and saying, the church. The church is no longer a light. And if the church is no longer a light, then the world will plunge into darkness. She's no longer salty. What hope does the world have? Amen. And we can go to the last slide. Yeah. 
What will it take for me to experience God? And someone, Brother Strowman, could say, I've already experienced God. And I would ask you this question. Do you want more? Amen. That's what I need. Mean. Lord, I want more. Amen. And the question, will he? Will he revive us again? Somebody said, I don't need revival. And I'm thinking this. If you see what I'm looking at, we ought to all say, Lord, I want that. Not only do I want it for me, I want it for my children and my grandchildren. Amen. Because me having an experience is not enough for them. Amen. It helps. It's a wonderful thing to have a testimony before your children and grandchildren. Amen. But they must experience it. Psalms 138, verse 7. We will close here. So I walk in the midst of trouble. That's where we're at. Right. Hey, we are in a dark world. <laughs> You know, as we can travel here, those processions, and people can look at it and say, oh, how foolish. And I told Brother Alavera, sad. That's what it is. These people are captured, enslaved in darkness. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, Thou wilt revive me. Yeah. That's not a question. <laughs> That's a declaration. Yeah. Thou wilt revive me. <clears throat> I can ask you to stand with me. We're going to close.
I suggested this morning. And this morning is about spirit. Tonight, what are you saying? What are you hearing? What have you been hearing? Judgment or revival? What did the Lord say a while ago? I will strengthen you again. Amen. So let's not waste this time. We may not have the power, but you can come in front. We have the power. The Holy Ghost power. Say, Lord, touch me. Touch me like you've never touched me before. I don't want to leave this place the same person I came in. I want to be transformed. Change my heart. I will stop loving the world. Amen. Get that idol out of my life, Lord. Amen. Amen. 